what Miss for God asks for you. If you can find one second in the presence of God, I guarantee you will be here today, blessed like you haven't been blessed an entire year. One presence, one glance from the Almighty God over on your life, favor upon your life, is better than a thousand years of men's promotion and wealth. That's who we are worshiping this morning. That's who we are seeing. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, Now the serpent was more subtle, or subtle, than any beast of the field. What does subtle mean? And other, subtle is a word that means not really, you don't really know it. They're slick, they're quiet. They, they kind of curl under rocks, kind of hide and blend it in trees. They don't make a bunch of noise. Not like lions who run around roaring and making sure you know that you're in their domain. The serpent was a very subtle creature. Satan chooses to use the most subtle things in your life to get you to rebel against God and His Word in your life. The finest girl, she's good upbringing. She's going to college. He'll use anything that you wouldn't even recognize or think would hurt you or make you stumble. He'll use the most subtle things in your life to cause you to rebel against the authority of God. And this is really what the Scripture is teaching us. The serpent was more subtle than anything in the field that Jehovah had made. And He said unto the woman, he said unto the woman, and that's all it took mm -hmm. for that subtle creature to speak a subtle word or whisper a subtle word, and that was out there. Let me move over to Romans chapter 5, verse 19, just to cut through a whole bunch of the story. And Romans 5, 19 says this, For as though, the, as for as through the one disobedience, what happened? Yes. The many were made sinners. Yes. Through the one man's obedience, through Adam's disobedience, rather, I'm sorry, the many, including you, your mama, your mama's mama, your mama's mama's mama. Am I making you mad yet? Yeah, I'm talking about your mama's mama. And I'm not going to flinch because this is what the scripture teaches us. We have all sinned. We have fallen short of his glory because of disobedience and rebellion to his authority. And this is what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve. And this is what we have, what we live in the consequences of sin and death because of it. So after God creates Adam, he instructs Adam not to eat of the tree. And we talked a little bit about this a couple weeks ago, the tree of knowledge. But the crux of the charge is not the mere fruit or the fruit of the tree. It wasn't that God was upset that they picked this certain fruit. Like my wife likes to grow plants. And she's got these pretty flowers growing outside. Actually, she had a lemon tree with a big fat juicy lemon on it. And she just enjoyed it. It just gave her so much pleasure to walk by this thing in the backyard and, and see that big and even her plants and flowers, she sees the flower. Yesterday, check this out. Hannah and Tolly Bear are in the backyard having themselves a ball. And they decide to start going to mom's plant and picking the flowers and doing my love me, love me not, whatever. She had a one on her finger like it was a ring and they were picking mom's flowers. And I said, ooh. <laughs> For the fruit's sake, it wasn't why God said don't touch it. There's a principle that God wanted us to understand. Now in Sandy's situation and what we did with the kid, she just don't want nobody to mess with her pretty flower. It's a step. It's her hobby. Obey me because I don't want you messing. But God, God's purpose for not having to not touch that tree in the garden is because of this very thing here, the tree of knowledge. And it was a tree of good and evil. And his purpose However, placing it in the garden and giving Adam that one commandment, that one rule, don't touch the tree. Anything else is, is open. You have the many. This is yours to enjoy. But the one thing, he put, he put one thing there for one reason, to teach Adam obedience. It's all about God teaching us obedience in our lives. If we really start counting from the time we wake up to the time we go to sleep, you'd be surprised how disobedient creature you really are. Amen. How much you truly rebel every single day. You would be, you would be, so you would surprise yourself. All the times your mind just begins to reject authority, even though you don't say it out loud, you just do it here, or you talk about authority, or you go through all. Just from the minute the day starts, if we could actually count the times you start falling into disobedience, Amen. you would, you would be a surprise. And Adam had to be taught obedience like any of us. Why did God put the tree there? If he didn't want to touch it, why put him there? It's God's fault. You always want to blame God, but listen, God wants to teach you obedience. So he'll put things in your life and he'll give you the choice to make, to obey his authority or to rebel against his authority. It's a rule saying that it's always been here, it will always be here until he finishes everything. So he puts Adam under authority
already so that he could learn. He might learn his very first class, his very first school, the very first lesson he chooses to teach men. So God placed all the creatures, he, cre he placed every creature in the earth under Adam's authority. Amen. But on the other hand, God placed Adam under his authority. Yes. So even though Adam was over everything else, guess what? <coughs> Adam still had an authority that he had to answer to. And he had to obey. So only only one for only a person who's under authority, saints, can can be an authority. Amen. God is supreme. A lot of us would love to challenge him and look him eye to eye and question him. We can't do it. You're wasting your time. You'll waste 50 years trying to challenge God and make this convince God that you're right and he's wrong. It don't happen. But many of us do it. I pastor people that do it. My daddy pastor people that do it. My grandpa pastor people that do it. People do it. They spend and waste their lives challenging God about what's good in their life and what's not good in their life. Yes, sir. And all they're doing is wasting their days, yes. wasting their time. But if we come, we can cut a whole bunch of that mess out and we just realize He is it. Yes, when, when He told Saul to kill the Amalekites, every child, everything, some of us will look at that today and say, what kind of God is God? That's why people hate your God anyway. They always bring up the Old Testament scriptures about things that happened in the Old Testament, but you have to understand, and I don't want to get to a whole bunch of discussion there. If God wants to kill somebody, He can do it, and I don't have to apologize to anybody. Why? Because He created it in the first place. It belongs to Him. And that goes, that's another point of a, a submission that we need to understand. Nothing you have is yours. Not even your own self. He gives you the freedom to make some choices. But it all belongs to Him. That's why we say we fall to His throne. We submit to Him because this is the reality of life. It all belongs to Him anyway. People will look at you and call you a fool. Man, my teachers in college, all the people that try to teach me, why would you submit yourself to a God you can't even see? <clears throat> Worship the God in you. It's your intellect. It's your creativity. It's you. And I'll always get you to try to step away from recognizing that He's the one that's in charge. But here we have Adam who was put into authority, yet can't has a very hard time being an authority because he can't submit himself. So, he put Adam in authority, and then he puts Eve under his Adam's authority, and we have a spiral all the way down from that point forward. But from the beginning, God has always ordered man to obey him. He didn't order man to be self-willed. He ordered the first commandment, the first rule, obey me. Do what I say do. Do what I say do, everything's going to be fine. Adam couldn't do that one thing. So as men's disobedience starts to, in, or rather, as people's obedience begins to increase in life, um, his actions, his duties, will start decreasing in life. Because the reality is, from the very beginning, we're full of business. When we come to the Lord, we come to God, we're full of business. We're full of activity. We have plans. We got things to do. I have things to do. Uh, God was always in my life, but I had things that Carl Nevels wanted to do. You all know I was supposed to be a millionaire by the time I was 35. <laughs> that was a goal of mine for a long time. In high school, I set that goal. And I meant to carry it out. And I told you before, I didn't care how I got the million. We could negotiate that, good or bad. I was going to get the million. But that was where I set my, my sights. That wasn't what God had for me. Do you know, Pastor, the few of you that are here is honestly... In, in my opinion, worth more than half a million dollars in the bank. Being able to serve God's people and love God's people and attach myself to the blessings of God and actually build this kingdom to the mow the yard in God's kingdom and to feed his sheep and to take care of what's most precious to him. He doesn't care about Fort Knox. He doesn't care about your country, your government, your White House. That's not what's important to God. Souls are what's important to God. So to be working and to be busy among God's people and the few of us there are, it's still such a blessing. It's more than I ever could dream of. Now, a million dollars would be nice too. I'm not, I'm not making fun or pointing negative finger at a million dollars. I'll take it. But I'm not missing anything. I haven't exchanged. I haven't lost something to gain something. I've gained everything. It's all his. You gotta have this this mindset. You gotta you gotta know this. But the minute we become we begin to seek the Lord, most of us want to do what we like, mm -hmm. and we refuse to do what we don't like. That's just human nature. How many of you guys go out every day and do the things you just don't like to do? <laughs> now, uh, some of us do because we have to. But do you make that conscious choice to go today and do the things you don't like to do, or do you go do the things you like to do? <laughs> exactly. 
you do the things, you eat the place you want to eat, what you like. You don't go to a, I'm trying to pick a nasty restaurant. But I don't have to, I'm not prejudiced against too many restaurants. I don't eat this about anywhere, but I'm trying to think. No, I'm not going to say nothing. I like everything, but that's a bad, bad choice. We just don't do the things we don't like to do. Yeah. If we don't like them, we don't like them, we don't do them. And we do what we like to do. So we never stop to think that we might be acting out of, are we acting out of, out of obedience? Because the things that you like to do may not be what God wants you to do. And the things that you don't like to do may be exactly what God wants you to do. So you can't just go by how you feel. You got to go by what's important or what you believe and perceive God is saying. So we do these things out of ourselves and not obedience to God, yet we call them God because it feels good. Because a wonderful God will, of course, let me do what feels good. Your, your God despises your flesh. You understand that you, what you are, your flesh, the feelings, your emotions that the flesh make you like are enmity with God. He hates and despises what we are because what we are has separated him from us. Yeah. And he's trying his best to bring us back into alignment with him, but we're stuck in this nasty, horrible place. He hates your flesh, and he's not going to let you spoil it. Amen. And he's going to fight against it every day. Lord. Yeah, you picked the wrong church. <laughs> you did. If you came here for good feelings and happy times in your flesh, pick the wrong church. Because nah, 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 I'm not going to waste your time. Go to the other one. <laughs> because we will continue to prepare you to accept the things that are uncomfortable in your flesh. You can't do what you want to do with your body and there's things you should be doing you need to be submitting yourself to do. So, men's actions should not be governed by knowledge. The things we do should never have been judged by the knowledge of what's good and what's evil and this is what's happening. We should be motivated by a sense of obedience at all times. But because we ate of that tree and now I can choose or I can actually identify what's good as opposed to what's evil, I make my daily choices on that premise. Okay, it's good to not cuss my wife out. I see that. By, with the new knowledge I just gained from this tree, it's good that I don't cuss my wife out. And we, we make the choice not to do it. So we live by the standard of what's good and what's evil. Never was supposed to be that way. God knew from the beginning that he was going to let you know what, he was going to take care of what's good and evil. All you had to do was obey him. We've gotten so far away from this place. We don't live here. The principle of good and evil um, is to live according to what's right and wrong. And we choose to do that. We feel that we have an active part in our society and in our life when we choose. Is it right or wrong to go to Libya, to Libya to, to that yesterday and, and, and make sure we establish a no-fly zone? Don't answer that question. That's a political, that's a, that's a political argument that at the highest levels of human government can be justified on both sides very easily. Only God has a real answer to that. Only God is able to answer what, what the United States' role, of any, I'm not talking about any other country, what the United States' role in Libya is, God has an answer to it. You can justify going over there to shoot their planes down and kill their soldiers because they're killing their citizens. You can justify that, but the scripture says don't kill. You let God be God, let God do what he wants to do. We would have never had to enforce a no fly zone because God would have taken care of the situation. Oh, pastor, come on, that's ridiculous. What are you telling us? Just let, just lay, lay down, let God do everything? In a way, I am telling you that. But the thing is, that's a problem. We chose to make those decisions, what's right and what's wrong. We know evil as opposed to what's good. And we've manipulated and it's all kind of become gray in the middle. And what are we supposed to do now? Yeah, okay, we're, we're willing to kill Robert if it's to defend ourselves. That's justifiable, isn't it, in the flesh? No. Not according to God's word. You won't get away with that. Because the scripture says, thou shalt not kill. Okay, it's not kill. It's not murder. It's The scripture says, don't take the life. But we justify because we have the power to do it. We justify taking lives in other countries or even killing our own citizens. Uh, we justify it and say, well, the government's doing that. And you kind of act like it's not us, but you're co-signing in your heart. Yeah. So rebellion has so many shapes, so many facets, so many forms. 
we have we have pretty much subjected ourselves to living in a world that is living under these concepts of what's good and what's evil. And God never intended for the world to have to deal with that. He intended for us to submit and be obedient to what He said to do, and let Him handle the rest. When, and when, when Moses brought the children of Israel out to the, to the middle of nowhere and there's an army coming behind to kill them, he didn't tell them to turn around and try to fight because you're going to die anyway. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Guess what happened? A miracle happened. And an ocean or a sea opened up before God's people and they walked through because they did what God was telling them to do. He will do miraculous things in the world and men will have no choice. He's going to do it when he comes back and establishes his throne. But right now, it's a time of us. We're just living in good and evil. And we're making our own decisions and we're not following the authority and obeying the laws of God. We're justifying it according to what we think is good or what's not. And, and we're getting ourselves deeper and deeper in a bunch of mess. The reason we're fighting wars in the Middle East in the first place is because we haven't respected God's law. Anyway, let me move on from that. Because we can get into politics real easy. We don't want to do that. But there's no authority outside of God's authority. All authority that's been instituted has been instituted by the Lord, by God, in, the, in heaven. All authority, the fact that he is the boss and he is an authority over man, Adam, established the principle of all authority originating from him. Even satanic authority, Pastor? Yes. Even satanic authority is instituted by God. Yes. If you are a servant or slave unto sin, Satan is your master. Mm -hmm. We have to know that. That's the scripture. When we fell from grace, we fell from our master and authority being God to the next level. Satan, the prince of the air, now has authority over the sinner and he's their master. Whether they want him to be or not, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And he's so subtle, he won't even tell you he's, a, he's your master. Mm -hmm. Has the devil ever told you all I'm your master? <laughs> <laughs> he's slick. He's not going to tell you he's your master because he knows you're rebelling. Ah, he lets you be boss. Thus he has 666. Human authority. Humanism is, is the idea that man can become God. Satan's not saying I don't want to be God. And that's a whole different lesson for another time. It's not Satan that cares about being God. Satan knows who he works for. Satan knows what he is. Satan, I believe, knows the end. It's man that has this foolish notion and he's the ultimate authority. And that he can be God. And that's why you get the ultimate, the man of perdition, the man of sin, the Antichrist, who will stand in a seat and declare himself to be God. And on that day, the true God is going to look down and say, I'm disgusted. It's going to be called a day of abomination. And, and, and moving on, because I'm getting, I'm getting behind. Um, but God is above all authority, saying all authorities are under him. That's why when you respect the principle of authority, you're respecting a true principle that's always been there. So don't think of I'll respect who I think deserves respect based upon my ideas of good and evil. No. An authority has been established. The Lord told you, and I just read the scripture to you. You need it again? Uh, 1 Peter 2, 13, 14. For his sake, respect all human authority. Every ordinance. Whether it be governor or king, respect it because it's the principle of authority and God has placed you under an authority. Now, I'm sorry. Let's move on. The first lesson that a Christian worker or, or, or any worker, really a Christian worker, is, should learn is to obey authority. So, we're under man's authority um, as well as having men be under our authority. This is how we have to coexist. There's no one in this room that can honestly raise your hand and tell me I don't have an authority. I, I, I know I'm not going to ask you because I know this isn't true. You go to work every morning in your own time because you recognize authority. You may not come to church on time because your authority at church isn't the same as your boss or your employer. But I'm not trying to be silly. I'm just saying, when you still have submitted yourself to authority even in your church, hopefully you have. Why be here if you have? But we submit ourselves to authorities. All of us are submitted to authority. The problem is we have to choose who's our authority and who's not our authority, and that's not always our right. That's not always our we don't have the bosses that we would like to have in very few situations. Do we? You get to pick one women, you get to pick one when you get married. But I guarantee you what he is when you marry him probably is not going to be what he is five years after you marry him. So it's not kind of hard to tell what kind of authority you put in his 
myself under. It took me, I wasn't even going to be under my wife, and it still took me six years to pray and say, Lord, is this the one that I'm going to be on my down with 50 years? Is this the one? I took it seriously, and we should always take it seriously. When you get a job, when you go write an application, don't sign the application, talk to the employer, and then decide two weeks later you want to flip them off and slam the door and walk out of the job. You honor that boss that you submitted yourself to. Amen. If you're going to leave the job, you ask God, and then you dismiss yourself in a kind and peaceful Amen. way. It's the same way with your church. Same way with anything you've, you've tied yourself to. Do it with respect and integrity. All the time, because it's your authority. And you serve your boss as you serve God. Amen. You serve as you serve your boss at work. And I'll keep saying boss at work because you get that better. In America, we get that better. I don't even have to say me. Even though I'm going to your pastor, I'm your pastor. But I'm going to keep saying the boss at work. You have to submit even when you don't agree with them. And that's going to be at least 75% of the day you won't agree with your bosses at work. At least 75% of the day. You may even get the nerve thing. You know what? I can't wait till they get somebody to bump them and put them in the hospital for a couple of weeks. How kind of crazy stuff going on in our head? When are they going to move and get promoted? Promote them to another city. Right? I mean, all kinds of ways. I don't know, good or bad, but that's the way we think. Right. Instead of honoring them and smiling at them and praying for them and really honestly recognizing that's my authority. And as I serve that authority, I serve God. That favor, the favor of your behavior alone, or your baby behavior alone, will give you favor with your boss. Yes. That before you know it, they love you. Yes. They are promoting you. They are elevating you. But we don't ever get to that point. Because we live in a world of rebellion. Mm -hmm. And we're subject to our silly mind. But even Jesus on the earth was subject. Not only to God, but also to other people's authority. Even Jesus was. Authority is everywhere, saints. It's everywhere. It's in the school with your teachers. I don't let my kids come home and talk trash about the teachers to me. I don't do it. Now, if it's a serious concern, and I hear something that doesn't sound right... Why is my daughter in class with this man at lunchtime when all the other kids on the playground? Don't let my daughter tell me nothing silly like that. Daddy, the teacher kept me in class today, and I was the only girl in there with him alone. I'll go talk to the teacher on something like that. Now, I still don't let my children come home and disrespect authority. They they talk about their teachers as if they're talking about their mom or me. Because I have to teach them to submit and respect authority. And that's a right. full-time job in itself. Yes, yes. Joshua's not here today. <laughs> and, and all of us, all of us, mm -hmm. I was the same way. But we don't let our children. At home, amen, there's authorities at home. There's authorities at work. There's authorities, the policemen on the street uh, driving these cars. And we do, we respect them though, pretty good. <laughs> I slammed them up, I brings a couple times. <laughs> We, were, we have no problem with the, the uh, most of the time with the police. However, we'll still sit in our cars and be like, man, I bet he don't even have high school. He got probably has a GED. Just talking silly. I'm, I'm sure I'm high, more highly educated. If he were more highly educated, probably wouldn't be. A, we start saying this silly stuff. The bottom line is you have an obligation to submit to every authority that's placed above you. It, it'll be lighter, a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter. But we have authority in church. Whenever a few of the brothers come together in church, whether it be five or ten people in the house of God, guess what? There's some kind of authority set up by God. There's going to be authority established in almost every group of people. And I think that's what we've gotten away from too. We like to look eye to eye at each other. you know. But the truth is, when God's people come together, especially when God's people come together, God has a hierarchy of command, a chain of command, and an authority that's just inherent. Yeah. It may be an elder saint. Honestly, in all reality, I submit to, to the deacons, uh, Minister Evans and uh, Evangelist Morrison and, and, and those that I've, I, I that are on my ministerial staff, I submit to them. And a lot of it, honestly, I look at them as if they are, I can't let them be pastor in my heart because I'm pastor, that's my job. But I respect them and, a, and a, I highly respect them as authorities in my life. And that's not unusual. However, I do have to know my role too. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I respect them because they, they just the, the age alone that they've been walking with God. Mm -hmm. yes. Alone. The age alone puts them in a place of eldership. Amen. And I have to respect that. I do I've been taught to respect my elders. Yes. 
Right. I've been taught not only by God's word, but my family. And we were taught to respect our elders. Mm -hmm. And I do it. And we were blessed when we do it. But there's always going to be a spiritual order that falls into place. Christian workers have to know this. You have to understand this. You have to, to really get your hands around that. Right. You have to learn that I, and honestly, I'm going to tell you something, the men that will bless you. But I'm going to move on. But some people don't know who the authority above them is. They don't know. They don't really care. They kind of just come to church Sunday and you don't see them again until next Sunday. They don't have to mingle or rub up against other saints anyway. So they don't really get the lessons that are all to be the greatest lessons in the body of Christ. They don't get the experience because they just say hi to you on Sunday. They listen to the preacher and they leave. That's why the scripture tells us about fellowship. Stop forsaking that. Assembling and accountability one another and rubbing on each other. Not rubbing on each other. <laughs> rubbing up against each other. Iron sharpens iron. That kind of rubbing on each other. Man, I'm messing up today. That's how yeah, there might be some un 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 only rubbing on each other. That might have been prophetic. But anyway, um, we have to rub off of each other. Friction. It's shaping, be shaping each other. We help each other. This is part of your growth. And it's a commandment from God. So when we fail to do it, you're not getting the benefits that God expects you to get. We should be growing and learning our place in the body of Christ. Not separating ourselves from the body of Christ. This is a whole other thing. I'm going to move on from that because I know some of you are thinking I'm going to stay there. I'm moving on. But it's really unfortunate how Christians today, they don't care um, about subjection. And they don't understand subjection. The scripture tells us that we're subjecting to one to subject ourselves to one another. To prefer us, to prefer one another above ourselves. <coughs> so no wonder there's so much confusion, there's so much disorder in the body of Christ because we have lost this principle in our world, in our society. Um, I tell you what, I really have been admiring Japan. And I feel and I pray for them. But I, I, I really admire, I admire their 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 government. They're not, they're not as oppressive as China is against the people. Right. But they have taught respect <clears throat> throughout the fiber of their their their, uh, their people that even though they're dying over there, there's radiation, there's no food, it's cold, half a million people are displaced, and all that stuff. You don't see the looting and the rioting that you know. You know what have happened here. <laughs> In our country, there's no disrespect, there's no reverence. Man, when you tell somebody O.J. Simpson's guilty, Watts goes up in flames. <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny, but this is the reality. Don't mess with me. We have to 